Good morning. I'm walking to an area which I've been requested and I was going to do it in the later episodes, but I thought I might as well do it in this one. It's called the John Bassalon position. There's where he earned his Medal of Honor. So I'll run that walk along the actuation of Spur Bloody Ridge, going down into his position. So it's only a roughly 15 minute video. If you want to know more about the Bassalon um, Medal of Honor incident, I encourage you to read as much as you can about it. It's quite an amazing effort he did. So I hope you enjoy. So this position was occupied on the October the 24th, 25th, 26th, 1942 by the 1st Battalion of the 7th Marines, um, which is some of you might know as Chesty's Pullers Battalion. And Hassel had a, a known, very well-known Marine called uh, Platoon Sergeant John Bassalone, who's machine gun section leader. So what area I'm walking down now is basically, I think it's going to be called the Sector 3 uh, track. Now, Vandegrift, the division commander, had his sectors divided up, defensive sectors, and Sector 3 was his southern sector on the line. And I'll show you in a map. But this sector here um, had a Sector 3 trail. It was an avenue of approach for the Japanese. I'm actually looking south. You can't see anything. It's jungle, but that's looking south, and that's the direction of the Japanese attack. So they're coming from that direction. Um, roughly three regiments, and they attacked over two nights. So my, my previous episode of Coffin Corner, I talked about how they attacked heavily on the second night at that location. But the first night, they attacked, I guess, in dribs and drabs due to the thick jungle, and the, um, they lost their unit cohesion. So they attacked roughly... Uh, platoon to company strength piecemeal so they'll allow the marines who are at this stage you know we're only 500 uh, men covering something like 2500 yards because the second battalion the seventh marines were all pulled out and was put on its place a place called cola ridge which is uh, closer to the Montanico. so during the time of the battle the seventh marines um, regimental anti-tank Unit, which is 37 millimeters, was positioned in this location. And John Bassalone and his two machine gun sections were supporting those 37s and covering this um, avenue of approach. I'm walking even with the Marines lines, so I'll just move straight in and see if we can find some um, bunker positions. This is thick jungle floor, so over the years, a lot of stuff accumulated in them, so they don't stand out as much as the ones on the car ridge. So I don't know if you're able to see it. Actually positioned in front of us. And there's some ones up here become a bit more clear. You can see how thick this jungle is. You now even during the time of the battle, um, the Marines were stuck down in here in this thick jungle. And they would cut 100 yard and 75 yard um, firing lines. Or firing lines, they call them. They also had a something like a four foot wide and about six foot high um, triple and, and quadruple apron of bob wire they were hoping the japanese would just snug up on that and they could take them out with machine gun fire so we're coming up to the the Barcelona position um the great and late john ennis the um australian historian who were who actually lived on guadalcanal for 20 years I designated this was the Bassalon position and I spent a couple of weeks just one-on-one -on -one with John and I corresponded him um, from 2009 to his death of last year. He brought me down to this position. This is what is known as the Bassalon position. A number of people have visited this spot and you can see it's a quite a large hole. And you're supposed to have one machine gun section of two heavy machine guns in this hole. If I pan around, that hole I just showed you almost connects. So if this is the Bassalon position, you probably would have had possibly one machine gun in there and one machine gun in there. When I first visited this position, you know, and some people would actually visit and they say, oh, this position, you know, because I'll orientate you for you. 
That's straight out looking toward the, the front lines. The Japanese were attacked in that direction there. So some people say, well, this position, if you look at the orientation of the bunker, it's facing basically that way. Well, if you know anything about machine guns and the placement of the machine guns, they're put in an enfilade or oblique fire, so they fire from the side. So that starts to go up the bloody ridge right in front of us, and I'll walk that way on the way out. There's several machine gun bunkers there, so if you had a machine gun bunker here, their field of fire would have been directly in, well, in that direction. It would have probably been cross-firing from a couple of other ones up on that hill there. And I'll go over here, this other bunker. This orientation is in that direction. So another crisscross. So here we are looking from the Japanese point of view to the Barcelona bunker. So the Barcelona bunker is about 34 feet, 35 feet directly in front of us. Now, the Marines had, like I said before, two or three um, lines of barbed wire. And I'll show you one strand, or remnant, not strand, really a pigtail left in the ground. You barely see it. Right here. That's the remnant. Most time of the year, this place is just covered with water, so I picked a dry time to come down and show you guys. All right, in Barcelona's own statement, he gave about seven months after the battle, gave it to two Marine officers in Quantico, and it's a written statement, and I've got that statement. He basically says the Japanese, or the barbed wire, was roughly 30 feet in front of him. So this correlates with the evidence here. I know there's been several um, bits of evidence located in this spot alone, um, from, I guess you could say, impacted bullets, Japanese buckles, fragments, and everything. If this wasn't Barcelona's position in front of us, it's very, very near it. Uh, but there's a lot of fighting going on right where I'm at right now. And Barcelona said after the battle, there was about, I think, 36 Japanese, maybe 34 Japanese between the barbed wire line and his bunker alone. So I'll walk back to the Barcelona bunker. And their fields of fire were, he said he could see only about 20, 20 yards on the other side of the barbed wire. So you can imagine... As a machine gunner, your field of fire isn't that vast. There's the Barcelona bunker. There's the second bunker next to it. And that's right in the area where the barbed wire was, the Japanese attack. Here we are walking further down the line from the Barcelona bunker. Barcelona said in his interview he was definitely was in the flat jungle. He wasn't up on the ridge. So I'll stop here. I don't know if you're able to see it. So that's the eastern spur of Blady Ridge. That's where the ridge comes down and ends. So he said he was in a flat, and he was attached to Charlie Company at the time. Normally he was in Delta Company, which was the weapons um, company. He was in Delta. His machine gun was attached to Delta. So I've got a map, and it shows the line between Charlie and uh, the next company, which was the Bravo Company, which was uh, located up on the ridge and further on. And the company um, boundary lines are at the foot of that ridge there. So when this jungle was cut down, I've seen it once. There's a number of fox holes behind us. And I read one account um, of a Marine. His rifle squad was actually supporting Barcelona. I don't know if you're able to see it. There's a fox hole or a bunker been right in front of us. Let's see if I can go down. You can see the defilade in the ground, but there's definitely a, a large one there. And that correlates because the rest of them are about 12 meters apart. And then as I, we proceed further up this trail, and I'll show you the machine gun bunkers up on this hill. This was a cluster of bunkers and it was the end of the line, so it was probably a major strong point for the Marines. This is directly in front of the Marine bunkers. I'm um, pan to the right. That's the hill. The Bastillon position is a bit further to my right. Machine gun bunkers up on that hill. Now I've noticed evidence here and it looked just like a road. You see the locals have been doing a bit of wood cutting here, but You'll notice the embankment on the right, it's cut down, this area is nice and flat, and then it drops off on the left hand side. And I've walked the base of this bloody ridge and there's a road clearly cut in here. So I was a bit, um, you know, confused, but I said, why would they put a flat road? I'm oh, sorry, big spider's landing on my head. It's gone now. Anyway, why would they put a big road um, directly in front 
of the machine gun bunkers. You know, would it be a supply road? It would make sense to put it behind. Then I came across this photo. And once I, I looked at this photo, someone said, I wonder where it is. And I knew automatically there's a good chance this photo was taken here at this location. You can note how thick the barbed wire was, which gave the Marines the um, advantage of the limited visibility ahead, hoping the Japanese would be um, hung up on the barbed wire long enough that they could take them down with machine gun fire. And you notice the thick jungle on both sides. That's a great photo and I think a great um, location um, tie-in. Now we're proceeding up this knoll. This is the far end of the eastern slope of Bloody Ridge. We'll start to see a few machine gun bunkers in a second. There's one directly in front of us. I don't know if you're able to see. The bunker there. And go to the right, which is facing northeast. Probably about 70 meters that way is the Bassalone bunker. And these machine guns would have been facing that way. And the Bassalone bunkers machine guns would have been facing right back toward us in that nice oblique in flight fire. And about 100 meters that way is the Sector 3 trail that goes straight to Fighter 1 airfield, which was an avenue of approach for the Japanese coming out of that thick jungle. Further up the hill, this is a great um, example of a machine gun bunker. You can clearly see this big fella. So, pan around. I don't know if you're able to see. Down below us is where I was filming with the barbed wire. So the barbed wire was right below us at the foot of the hill. Thick barbed wire strands. This machine gun position, I'll orientate myself. Basically facing that direction. The Japanese were coming from that direction. This machine gun covered that area there and would have provided great in-flight fire. No, it's covered with bunkers. It's eastern slope of Bloody Ridge. These are pretty well preserved. That's a large bunker. Someone's been digging around in this one. Oh, there's a little bit of a relic. Pretty sure this comes off the of hand grenade cardboard um, shipping canisters. So this was the end caps. So they had two end caps on them, cardboard tube. Pull them out and um, pull the grenade out. I know they use a lot of grenades. <laughs> That's obviously not part of the battle. Local store in the trash. What's this little fella? Oh. Some type of ration, I'd say. I think it might be soluble coffee, they call it. Instant coffee. I'll have to have a look later and see. So these places really never been um, looked into. I mean, I could probably dig around here and find quite a bit of stuff. And I would have walked over hundreds, if not thousands, of bullet casings, at least. Grenade fragments. Oh, this is a remnant of one of the big Banton trees. You know, I spoke to one of the veterans of the battle and he mentions these big trees. Well, here, I imagine this fella here was during the time of the battle. Pretty be cool if you could get in there and uh, probably get a bit of shrapnel and bullets out of that one. But yeah, they were large and huge. In fact, up um, Mount Austin, the Japanese built their pillboxes out of them at the base of the trees. So it's a good example. Most of these large trees have been gone over the years for this wood. You can imagine how much wood that one would have supplied. So yeah, that, this was definitely here during the time of the battle. On, on the knoll again. You can probably see the depression there. That's another bucket hole. Once again, if you can look out here. Bassalon's position's in front of us in that thick jungle, about probably 100 meters. Feel the fire from this one. The Japanese are coming from the southern direction that way. Hope you've enjoyed this episode on the Marine Legend. I'd recommend you read about his and his team's actions on that night. Thank you.